Meanwhile, in the Western world, we believe in radical individualism. Do your own thing, man. You're on your own. The government has no obligation to give you anything, right? Pull yourself up by your bootstraps. The government is best that governs least. We believe in libertarianism. You know, libertarians drive me crazy. They should love America as it is right now. We are the most libertarian country in the industrialized world, right? National health care? Oh, we can't have that. That's communism. If you give people the right to see a doctor when they're sick, that's communism. You can't have that. Oh, you know, uh, free college and universities like almost every other industrial country? Oh, we can't do that. Oh, you know, people should pay and be in debt for years to go to college, right? Oh, you know, uh, build roads, pay for roads. We can't do that. We got all these wars to fight. You know, we got to blow things up. We got to have the military, right? And, and why should, you know, why should the government be building up infrastructure, right? This country should be a paradise. All the Ayn Rand friends, all the Milton Friedman enthusiasts, all the Murray Rothbard, Ludwig von Mises fans, they should be dancing and celebrating right now. They're the most bitter people. I don't get it. I really don't get it. They're all bitter and they're like, oh, this isn't real capitalist. America's a, America's a communist kind of, they're crazy, right? And, and the funny thing is everything that, that people say, every stereotype people have in their head about socialists and communists is so true for libertarians, right? Right, right, you know, libertarians, if you point to any problem in the United States and blame it on capitalism, they say, well, it's not real capitalism, right? Right? That's the stereotype, right? They're a bunch of campus Trotskyites, right? It's not real social. No, it's not real capitalism, right? And furthermore, they don't care about the consequences, right? They admire Augusto Pinochet. How many people did Augusto Pinochet kill directly, right? I mean, when he came to power, he was rounding people up in sports stadiums and killing them, but not just directly. Look at the result of his economic policies. Chile, under, under Pinochet in the 1970s, 20 to 30 percent unemployment. Um, they've actually done studies uh, where there are there are people in Chile who were, were children during the reign of Augusto Pinochet when he came into power and brought in Milton Friedman and the Chicago School of Economics who have become mentally disabled because of childhood malnutrition they got under the Pinochet regime, right? Because all these food subsidies were cut. There used to be food subsidies under the Chilean government. They were all cut by the Pinochet government. So all kinds of children all over, all over Chile, when their parents got all their food subsidies suddenly cut off in the aftermath of the 1973 coup, they didn't have proper food. And the price of food skyrocketed. The average family in Chile was spending about 70% of their income on food. And as a result, you know, people were, children were developmentally disabled. People died. It was economic destruction of a country. And the Chilean economy didn't start to improve until the 80s, the early 80s, 1982, 83, when they started nationalizing things and reasserting government control and stopped listening to Milton Friedman and kicked Milton Friedman out of the country. You know, you know the economic policies of Milton Friedman uh, the economic policies of Jeffrey Sachs, uh, these you know neoliberal free market policies, they were a disaster in Latin America as they were imposed across Latin America, first in Chile, then in Argentina, then eventually in Bolivia and in Venezuela in the 1990s. They've been a disaster. They've led to mass starvation, mass suffering, mass death. Then, after the fall of the Soviet Union, these folks, you know, the, the Chicago School, economic theorists, Jeffrey Sachs, they all went into Eastern Europe in the 1990s as well. And it was the same thing, economic destruction. People even used the word economic genocide to describe what they were doing. That's how some economists described it. These policies are disastrous. But if you point that out to any libertarian, well, you know, it's justified because we have to get to real capitalism. It, it's crazy. So every stereotype you have in your head, right? Communists don't care how many people die in order to carry out their social experiment. We've heard that before. Communists, oh, whenever there's, you know, some socialist country that has a problem, they say, well, it's not real socialism. Libertarians do that. They absolutely do that, right? And in, in terms of libertarian, you know, thought, the USA, as it is right now, with crumbling schools, crumbling infrastructure, you know, people, you know, you know, health care costs through the roof, you know, in every way, we are as close to the libertarian, you know, ideal as any Western country has ever been. Right? Obamacare, you know, yes, okay, yes, the government's involved a little bit, but compared to how it's involved in every other industrial country, it's not. Our educational system, again, yes, okay, does the government facilitate student loans? Sure, but compared to every other industrial country, we've got a laissez-faire policy when it comes to education. And as a result, the country is a wreck. Right? The country is a wreck. Libertarians should be dancing up and down and saying, look, look at, look how great it is, but it's not, right? But then their answer is always, oh, we've got to go, we got to do it more, right? It's just not, it's just not uh, libertarian enough, right? We just got to, you know, completely get rid of public education. The fact that we still have public schools, that means we're communists. 
I mean, you talk to these people, it's never enough. Never, you know, it wasn't enough when they wrecked Chile. wasn't enough when they wrecked Argentina. wasn't enough when they wrecked Bolivia in the 1990s. wasn't enough when they, they wrecked Venezuela in the 1990s and things got so bad you had the riots and the Caracazo and the, the country, did people didn't have electricity and ultimately Chavez, you know, emerged to, to repudiate neoliberalism in the 1990s. You know, uh, you know, it wasn't enough that they wrecked Eastern Europe and people were starving and sex trafficking and all of that. No, 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 no. You know, it's never real libertarianism, right? Never real libertarianism, right? Uh, you know, if only they had just privatized more, right? That, you know, capitalism is always the answer. And the, whenever there's a problem with, with the results, I mean, Milton Friedman, the libertarian ideologue, was overseeing economic policies that led to huge destruction. But it's just, it's, somehow it's not legit, Right. Uh, you know, I mean, that's, that's, that shows, that, that's the craziness, right? Because libertarianism, I am convinced, is based on the fact that these people, they used to be just your plain old conservative Republicans, right? They thought America was a great country, capitalism is a great system. You don't like it here, why don't you move to someplace else? But finally, they had an awakening, right? Someone pointed out to them, hey, the Iraq War isn't good, so finally, someone convinced them things were not perfect. And then they had this ideological moment where they're like, oh, no, right, American capitalism isn't, it isn't working perfectly. Oh, my God, we, we do have problems here. Oh, but it must be because we're communists, right? The USA is communist. Oh, there we go. Oh, oh, now I've got it figured out. Oh, okay, good, good. I don't have to change my ideology. I don't have to question anything I believe. Uh, you know, uh, the USA is communist. That explains it, right? Why are people unemployed? Oh, that's because the USA is communist. Oh, oh, I got it figured out. That's your average libertarian. That's what these people are. They don't want to change the underlying ideology. They don't want to question any of the of the Kool-Aid that they've drunk their whole lives. They want to keep believing in capitalism. They want to keep believing in survival of the fittest, keep believing this disgusting ideology of the British Empire. They want to keep not having any compassion, keep, you know, not believing that you know in any empathy, keep thinking in the virtue of selfishness, keep holding on to these psychopathic Ayn Rand concepts that if you feel sorry for someone or you want to help someone, that's a character defect, and you should be you should be happy that people are hungry and unemployed. They want to keep holding on to this demented mindset that has created the mess we're in. And they just want to say, oh, well, that's because the USA is communist. The USA is communist. Ha, 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 ha. You know, it's, it's pretty sad. You know, it's pretty sad that people just, you know, they're going to go to their graves. You know, you know, I mean, you know, they're, you know, you know, they're going to go to their graves. You know, the USA is going to keep having all the problems we're having. And they're going to keep saying that somehow that's because we're communist. You know, I mean, it's, it's really sad. It's really, really sad. Libertarianism is, it's these people have been inculcated with Cold War ideology, and they keep they want to keep believing it. They they just want to hold on to it. They want to keep believing capitalism is the greatest system. All of the communism and socialism are the most evil things. They want to believe it. They really want to believe it bad. And no matter what you say to them, you know they're true believers. They are religiously dedicated to believing that somehow greed is good. And as John Maynard Keynes put it, the most despicable men for the most despicable reasons are somehow going to work for the benefit of all. That's what, you know, the, the, the libertarian mindset is. It, it really is. And it's, it's very, very sad. Um, and, and you almost wonder with libertarians. I mean, you know, I, I went back to the British Empire when I was talking about Dracula, right? Right. Remember that? Those of you who've been with us, I hope some of you are still here. I know there's, you know, we got 51 people on here. It's going great. But I remember I was talking about Dracula earlier, right? And, and that Dracula, you know, kind of how, you know, they can't talk about sex, but they've got this demented kind of sexualized violence and you had Jack the Ripper and, and all of that. You know, while that was going on, you know, that was the rise of the British Empire, colonizing people. And, you know, you had the Victorian teaching you should never hug your children. You had, you know, this kind of authoritarianism in school and all of that. And the, the rise of kind of the British colonialist, imperialist mindset. Um, you almost wonder, you know, you see these libertarian, a lot of these folks, they just don't want to feel compassion. You know, if they hear about someone being unemployed or someone who's hungry or, or all that, they don't, they're afraid. It's like they're, they're terrified that if they admit that that's wrong, if they empathize with that person, that somehow they're going to be weak, right? A lot of them are, are guys and they've got this macho thing going on and they want to sit there like, yeah, I don't care. You know, I mean, you know, or, or you got like the British woman, what was her name? Um, I actually met her, which is kind of a weird story. Um, uh, I actually, uh, you know, what, she's the British right wing columnist. I can't remember her name, though. I met her, though. That's the funniest thing about it. Katie Hopkins, right? And they asked her, you know, well, what if people die because they don't have health care? And she said, that's good. Then they won't have children, right? They think they're being so tough. They think they're being tough. Uh, by not having any empathy, by, by just being completely selfish and all of that. And that's really what it's dedicated. That's what's behind a lot of it, is they think that if they admit 
that, that they feel any empathy for somebody or they have sympathy for someone who's suffering, then they become less tough and that, that, that makes them look weak. But in reality, they're revealing themselves to be quite weak because that's, that's quite a defensive position to be in. You know, this kind of edgelordy teenage, I don't care about anyone else, I'm only for myself, you know, that's Anton LaVey, right? You can read, you know, Anton LaVey, the, the stupid 1960s philosopher who tried to start the Church of Satan, right? You read it, it's, it's the same kind of mindset, right? And it's this, I don't care about anybody, I will not have compassion for others. They're like juvenile, teenage edlord, edgelords tantruming. And, and that's really what's, what's behind all this. I don't have any compassion, I am so tough, I don't have any empathy. And it's, it's childish. It's really childish. Um, and, and, you know, this might be a good transition. I wanted to talk about this because, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of things we can talk about. But while we're talking about the, the childishness and the edgelordism of libertarians, it's, it's an important transition because it's all over. The, you know, I'm a millennial. I'm 30 years old. I'm a millennial. I know, you know, now I'm talking to younger people who are like 19 and they're not even millennials. They call them Generation Z. So I guess being a millennial like I am, I'm 30 years old, that makes you old. Uh, but regardless, a lot of millennials, you know, I, I, I talk to young people my age. I look at all the things that are going on. You know, our generation is too emotional. I'll just say it. I'll, I'll self-criticize. I'm guilty of it, too. We're all guilty of it. But I, I, I challenge people that are of the millennial or the Generation Z, look back on recent problems or problems that you've had over the course of your life and ask yourself, hey, how much better would the situation have been if I had just calmed the calmed down, I, I was going to use an expletive there, but I, you know, we don't want to use bad words here on YouTube Live. But uh, you know, how much better would the situation have been if you just calmed down, right? And that that emotions everywhere in our society right now, you know, it, it, everything is promoting emotions. If you watch American TV, hugely emotional. You walk down the street, you're going to see ads that are trying to pull your emotions out of you. You turn on the music on the radio, super, super emotional music, right? And everything is, we've grown up in a society where media is everywhere. Media is just in your face, trying to get you to be emotional, just trying to get you to be emotional, emotional, emotional. And so we have a generation of people that are just pumped up with emotions. And if you get on the internet, if you listen to any of these political debates, Everything is just so loaded in, in emotion, right? It's like someone someone can't be disagreeing with you. They are oppressing you, right? Someone can't, you know, it, and, and emotion is everywhere. Emotion, emotion, emotion. And emotions are, are human. Human beings have emotion. I'm not saying that emotions are bad. It's okay to have emotions. In fact, you know, you, you do have emotions, right? And if, you, if your emotions don't come out one way, they're going to come out in another way. And people that think they're completely emotionless are usually the most emotional. They just, you know, they don't have any control. You know, emotions are important, but we are a very, very emotional generation. And that, you know, it was, you know, it's interesting. For years, I wouldn't listen to any classical music, right? When I was growing up, I, I, you know, I listened to the Beatles. I was into like oldies, rock and roll. Uh, I was, I lo I've always liked folk music, but I always just hated classical music. I thought it was boring. I just thought it was boring, and uh, you know, uh, I had very strict parents that would only let, let me listen to NPR, and so I was always hearing they would always turn on classical music, and I was just like, oh, I hate classical music. I had a roommate in college, um, and he was a music uh, major. He wrote um, music, and he was studying uh, uh, music composition, um, and he got me to listen to Wagner, Wagner, and. That I listened to Wagner and I started listening to Wagnerian music and I suddenly found, oh wow, like classical music doesn't have to be boring. That's what I thought, right? And I, so I started to like, you know, Wagner's music, Flight of the Valkyries, and you know, and I liked Wagner. I still like Wagner. It's good music. Um, you know, I'm not going to endorse the man's political views. Obviously, very problematic. But but uh, you know, the music is very emotional and and all of that. And so it was like I could like Wagner because I I was hearing I was growing up in a world where I was hearing all this millennial music, and so I. I, you know, and I was hearing, I was hearing the music that was popular at the time. I was also hearing, you know, old 60s rock. And so it was all emotional and I could listen to Wagner. I could appreciate it because it was emotional. But then, you know, about two years ago, someone was explaining to me, um, you know, before Wagner, they were basically, you know, criticizing modern classical music. And they pointed out to me that if you listen to Beethoven or Bach or Mozart, if you listen to that kind of music, it has an intellectual appeal rather than an emotional appeal, right? And they pointed out to me that if you listen to classical music, it's almost like it could be written in mathematical formulas. The notes are making patterns and that it's not appealing to the emotional part of your brain. It's appealing to the rational part of your brain. 
And when the person said that to me, I thought, huh. And so I turned on some Mozart, some Beethoven, some Bach, and I realized that it's actually enjoyable. But the reason that I had not liked classical music prior to that was um, the reason that I, I had not liked classical music prior to that was because I had only come to appreciate music in an emotional way. And I had not thought to appreciate music in an intellectual way. I had not thought of listening to music like reading a book. I thought of listening to music like, you know, I want to jam and, you know, Stairway to Heaven and, and all of that. But when, when it was pointed out to me that, that, that Bach, Beethoven, you know, all this music that came before Wagner, it all has an intellectual appeal. And it's appealing to the intellectual side of your brain rather than the emotional side. And that the beauty is, is, is reached not with emotions, uh, that that was a huge, huge discovery for me when this was pointed out to me. And so now I love classical music. I try to wake up in the morning with classical music. I try to go to sleep at night with classical music. And I've learned that, that you know, we live in a society that is just, I mean, it's emotional overload. Emotions are everywhere, right? I mean, years ago, people thought that King Kong, I'm talking about movies again, King Kong, people thought that was a scary movie. Right? I tried to watch the original King Kong. I almost fell asleep. I mean, you know, it, it, people saw that. They thought that was super emotional and scary. Um, you know, and we live in a society where our, our emotional tolerance has been jacked up to such a high level. And we're, we're looking for, you know, everything is in terms of emotions. And that's, I'm convinced, that's a big factor in why, you know, Americans can't find their own country on a map is because emotional, em emotions are not completely tied in with the human intelligence. Um, you know, that, that in a lot of ways, emotions, emotions appeal to a part of the brain that is, is very animalistic, is fight or flight, um, you know, is, is very much, uh, you know, is, is fight or flight, uh, you know, panic, rage, fear, terror, excitement, you know, these are not, you're not thinking clearly. And I'll say the same for, for sexuality, you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not advocating puritanical values, but, you know, the fact that there is naked, naked people all over billboards and stuff, you know, when, just like you're not thinking clearly when you're in a rage, you're not thinking clearly when you're terrified, you're also not thinking clearly when you're sexually aroused. And that, and that these emotions that are everywhere, the sex and violence that is everywhere, it has taken a toll on the psyche of the population. People become stupider. I, I am convinced that people lose their ability to be intelligent because there is so much sex and violence everywhere and because emotions are everywhere. And that this, this kind of emphasis on emotions that is everywhere nowadays in, in U.S. culture is taking a toll on the, the intelligence of the population. And that the reason that so many people in the USA don't know where their country is on a map, can't tell you all kinds of basic things, uh, you know, the reason for that is rooted in the fact that there's emotional, everything is so emotional. And that, that emotions are cheap, are cheap in a lot of ways. You know, it's funny. You know, I've noticed that in movies nowadays, movies and television, gross, grossness and shock value has replaced hard work. Uh, I'm going to drink some water now. No more of that, that soda stuff. I'm going to drink some water. But, like, if you watch a lot of comedy shows, instead of, you know, having a really clever joke that makes you laugh, they gross you out. And they show you some, some gross sexual or blood and gore stuff, and, and that's supposed to be funny, right? A lot of horror movies, instead of coming up with a very scary, elaborate story that makes you scared, instead, they gross you out with a bunch of blood and gore. And gore and shock value, and it, you know, takes the place of of, you know, of, of, you know, scary stories, right? Action movies, right? Instead of coming up with a very, very complicated plot that's very exciting, they show you a lot of blood and gore and guns and violence, you know, and that takes the place. And that gross and shock value has come to substitute, you know, what was beautiful in art in times past. Um, and that, that it's really kind of a tragedy, but that, that grossness Grossness, it's almost like, you know, imagine that, that uh, you know, that, that, that someone put tofu in your food. Instead, of you wanted to go bite into a great hamburger and you just got a mouthful of, like, tofu. Grossness is, is it's, it's cheap. It's, it's doing a half, half job. Um, and that grossness has taken the place. Grossness and shock value has replaced funny. Grossness and shock value has replaced uh, scariness. It's replaced action. You know, and that grossness uh, is everywhere in U.S. society now, and that grossness is cheap. It's not. It's it's taken taken over the real value of art. So, what are people saying in the comments? Um, 
Gavin Lockhart is agreeing with me. He's saying it's like comedians in the 60s start throwing the F word everywhere as a filler to replace actual humor. Exactly, Gavin. You are on the exact same page with me. That is exactly what I'm saying. Grossness and obscenity and, and you know, uh, you know, you know, sex, over-the-top sex, over-the-top violence, has come to replace actual art, which is actual work. And that's my frustration. Um, uh, you know, and K-I-N-K-Y is agreeing with me. Kaninki or Kinky or, or whoever is also agreeing with me. Um, uh, people are criticizing. I'm not here to criticize any genre of music. People are criticizing rap music. I don't know. I mean, I'm not here to criticize a genre of music. I've heard rap songs that I enjoyed. I've heard rap songs that are quite intellectually stimulating. I'm criticizing a tendency to emphasize emotion. And, and, you know, emotion is important. And also, you know, listen to Beethoven, that's emotional stuff. I mean, the Fifth Symphony, I mean, da-da-da-da, da-da-da-da. I mean, that's, there's plenty of emotion in Beethoven, but the emotion is tempered, it's calm. The main appeal is intellectual. You're listening for the patterns in the music, and, and the emotion is there beneath the surface, right? I mean, if you read, you know, older novels and stuff, you know, the emotion is there, but the emotions come from the story. The emotions are not dominant. It's not about emotion. The emotions have a secondary quality. Um, interesting stuff there. Um, uh, next to my Russian son, you, Ray, are my hero. I, I don't know. That's Henry Rennes. I don't know if he's talking to me. Oh, he's saying you, you are my hero. Well, I'm glad to be your hero, Henry. I'm always glad to inspire people. I'm having a great time. You know, it's been two hours. We are about to hit the two-hour mark, uh, but I'm happy. You know, it's it's Saturday night. You and me, were on here. It's been roughly 50 people on here for this live we are having a great time. Uh, Gavin Lackhart, we seem to be approaching the new, an age of the gross, Spiru Agnew. Well, I'm not going to quote Spiru Agnew. He wasn't uh, the nicest guy. Um, you know, the nodding nabobs of negativism and all of that. But Spiru Agnew, I mean, when he says the grossness is taking over, I mean, he's right. And that's one of the problems, I think, is that, that it's an easy sell. And this is a problem with a lot of art nowadays, is that it's an easy sell, right? You know, uh, why does Hollywood make the same movie over and over and over and over and over and over again? Why do they do that? Well, the reason they do it is because it's a guaranteed sell. They're not taking a risk on a new idea, on a new product, on a new plot, and maybe it'll work and maybe it won't. You know, doing something innovative requires a risk. It's a financial risk. Hollywood doesn't want to take a financial risk, right? And so, you know, gross reproduction of the same thing over and over again, not taking risks, not taking new innovations, not not trying something out, you know, it's a way to re guarantee a return on your investment. You know, there's this myth that, that that capitalism is the only system that ever leads to creativity. Oh, that's a complete myth. That's that's completely false. You know, who invented the AK-47 rifle, the LED lights? Um, you know, I mean, China is making huge breakthroughs in computer technology. Uh, and actually, interestingly, all uh, you know, all of the technological advances that were necessary to create the iPhone came from government-sponsored research. The government, even in capitalist countries, the government tends to sponsor most of the innovation and the creativity. The private sector does not like to risk money. It's in there; they're in there to see a return on their investment. And yes, they do take risks. They do invent new things. I'm not going to deny that. Uh, however, uh, they prefer not to. They just want a secure investment. They want to keep making money. Um, you know, um, in fact, you know, the Koch brothers, uh, these, these right-wing capitalists, their father, uh, Fred Koch, uh, he invented a new method of thermal cracking, of turning oil into gasoline. And he, you know, did the U S free market economy of the 1930s and twenties just embrace him for it? No. In fact, the only country that would try out and, and really put his new method uh, of thermal cracking into practice was the Soviet Union. And really, the Koch brothers, despite being right-wing libertarians uh, you know, and Ayn Rand admirers, and they actually owe uh, their entire fortune to the Soviet Union. It was the Soviet Union that was willing to try out the new innovative techniques that Fred Koch, their father, invented in the oil industry. Um, and the response of the American oil capitalists was to try and sue him and prevent anyone from doing it. And in order to maintain the status quo where they were on top. Capitalists want to maintain the status quo um, be, so they can be on top. And that's why China is leading the world right now in electric cars and in green technology because the current global order is really based on the fact that we have an oil-based economy. That's what the current, current global order is based on, right? Chase Bank, ExxonMobil, uh, you know, BP, that's, you know, the British, that's HSBC Bank, uh, Chevron, Shell Oil, 
you know, the big entities that dominate the global financial markets that are key in the London Stock Exchange, key on Wall Street, are all tied in with petroleum, with oil. And so they, they want to keep us in an oil-based economy. But China, on the other hand, is pushing electric cars like crazy because one of their weaknesses geopolitically is the fact that they're dependent on oil. Um, you know, that South China Sea, that's where a lot of the oil tankers bring the oil in. And that's why China is desperate to keep it secure um, because they want to make sure they can keep that flow of oil. China, China, their, their economy, which is producing huge amounts of, you know, copper, steel, aluminum, cell phones, biggest telecommunication, it's it, biggest telecommunications manufacturer in the world. It's dependent on the importing of oil. And that's why they want to keep the South China Sea secure. They're not trying to colonize the South China Sea. They're trying to keep it secure so that the USA doesn't, you know, doesn't block their oil. And also, that's why China is working in Nicaragua to build this new canal to counter the Panama Canal. Uh, because, again, the USA basically controls the Panama Canal, and already we've seen Cuban ships stopped in the Panama Canal and searched. Um, and, and, you know, the USA, even though there's a treaty and they're supposed to just let people go through the Panama Canal, they control, you know, the USA ultimately has control. And so China is working with the government of the Sandinistas in Nicaragua to try and build this new canal to counter the Panama Canal. And you'll notice that, that now U.S. media is demonizing the government of Nicaragua. There's protests in Nicaragua that are basically funded and supported by uh, Western capitalism. It's almost, you know, it's basically a textbook color revolution going on there where the population supports Daniel Ortega and the Sandinista government based on Christianity, socialism, and solidarity. But you have the rich college kids that are getting encouraged and paid to go out and protest and being supported by the international media, the USA is trying to bring down the government of Nicaragua right now to stop this canal and stop the prosperous socialist government